Happy Monday, everybody. Every Monday, I go over my favorite best of three and best of one decks in standard. And this is the 14th week of Outlaws of Thunder Junction. And this will be the last week before rotation. So we get to see some of the our favorites before they go away. And um, what I'm going to do this week is I'm going to mix things up a little bit. I'm going to start off with best of one and then end with best of three. Um, best of one tends to be a little bit faster to cover, and then the best of three is a little bit more in depth for those who really want to get into the, the gritty details. <laughs> so um, if you're new to or returning to Magic, we're just about to go into rotation for Bloomborough. And uh, what I like to do is I like to track the changes of the decks throughout the weeks. And what this allows me to do is kind of see what the core is and the cards that are coming in or coming out are then kind of the flex spots that you can kind of, you know, consider if you'd like to do them for your own build. And uh, to remove my bias, what I like to do is I like to use a third party tracking website called Untapped. And uh, this way, <laughs> it's not really a matter of opinion, it's just ideas. And we kind of talk about why, uh, you know, I'll throw my speculations in there as well. So let's get started. Um, the first one up here is Mono White Humans. This was the number one deck in best of one according to the tracker, which tracks data over thousands of matches for bronze to mythic. So not necessarily just for mythic players, but for the, the whole shebang. And uh, if we compare this one to last week, we can see very few changes have occurred to this list. We're dropping two planes and we're bringing in a Cavern of Souls and an Aganjo. <laughs> which I think the original list should have had in the first place. I don't know why it didn't. Um, but then we're going to 61 cards and we're playing the Archangel Elspeth, which can give your like Adeline flying so that you can get through problematic death touch blockers um, like Preacher of the Schism. Uh, you can also create lifelinkers. And then the entirety of our deck outside of the Knight Errant of Eos is three or less. So the ultimate for the minus six can bring back a ton of creatures. And this has been one of the decks that I've been using on the ladder <laughs> despite getting like 15 out of 17 games on the draw. <laughs> but I really enjoyed it. Uh, I'm going to be sad to see it go because we're losing Adeline, Brutal Cathar, and uh, Thalia, among others. Number two, according to the tracker, was Boros Convoke. And we've seen this one time and time again throughout the weeks in Outlaws of Thunder Junction. And uh, this week, though, what we've they've dropped the one copy of Regal Bunnycorn and brought in an additional copy of Sanguine Evangelist, and it's really just dependent on what matchups you're experiencing. So if you go back way back months ago, I did a best of three sideboard guide where I talked about the differences between Sanguine Evangelist and the Regal Bunnycorn. If you want to know the specifics on that, I can't remember off the top of my head, um, but generally damage based removal like Case of the Gateway Express and Red Removal has a harder time with the Regal Bunnycorn, and then Sanguine Evangelist is weaker to exile. Um, War Leader's Call was also cut from this list. A lot of times we'll see the Sanguine Evangelist or the War Leader's Call being run in best of three. Sometimes we see both in best of one. Um, usually it's a pretty good sign to see like how much Azorius control is coming up because Case of the Gateway Express is terrible to have in a control matchup where they have very few targets to hit, whereas the War Leader's Call is better in the mid-range to control matchups that uh, last longer. And then uh, so we're deciding to run the other two copies of the Case of the Gateway Express compared to last week. And then as far as the lands go, we've dropped a Plains, a Thran Portal, and a Sundown Pass to bring in the fourth copy of the Battlefield Forge, two more copies of the Inspiring Vantage, and one more Mirix. And I like this build of the lands better than last week's. Number three, according to Untapped, is Mono Red Aggro. And we've kind of seen um, Mono Red Prowess come up into the top and then drop down, and then Mono Red Aggro come up and then drop down, and they kind of cycle depending on how much single point interaction there is in the meta. So, Slick Shot Show Off, if your opponent has instant speed interaction to be able to destroy this as you target it with a combat trick, you end up getting two for one, and it's pretty detrimental for this deck. So, the more that you're bumping into the cutdowns and the go for the throats, and, and you know, instant speed removal, then Mono Red Prowess is going to perform worse than Mono Red Aggro. This list is very similar to Mono Red Prowess in the sense that not every Mono Red Aggro list is running Slickshot Show Off. We see a lot with Godric and with Squee. Um, and, uh, but this one's still having some of the cards that we typically see in Mono Red, like the Bloodthirsty Adversary and the Charming Scoundrel. So compared to last week, we've dropped the one copy of the Shivan Devastator, which has a little bit of synergies with Godric Cloaked Reveler. 
Uh, we've dropped two copies of the Charming Scoundrel, which, by the way, if your hand is empty, you can discard no card and then draw a card. I see a lot of people forget about this. <laughs> um, we're, we're dropping the two copies of Felden, which is usually included to give the deck a little bit more uh, dig. And then we're dropping one copy of Squee, or sorry, one copy of Godric and the two copies of Squee, Dubious Monarch. And going for more of the prowess build by including the Slickshot Showoff and the Antagonize as well as two copies of the Demonic Ruckus, which can help you with Boros Convoke and how it's going wide. And then to make room for this, we're dropping two Mishra's Foundries, which I also like because I think that if we're going to go for the lower curve and include the Slickshot Showoff, then we don't need as many lands in the deck and should be fine with just 20. Number four, according to the tracker, was Azorius Control. So we've seen a rise in Azorius Control, which I think... We, you know, if you go back and watch throughout the weeks, you can actually see how the decks were teching um, away from there being any any uh, Zorius control until there was enough space for it to kind of come back. And um, it's always fun to see how it goes throughout the weeks, at least for me. And uh, this le this week, what we can see is they've dropped the Kutzel's Flanker. And that one's a one that's pretty good against Mono Red because it gives you some of that instant speed as a blocker and then life gain. It's also really good against the Teamer Landfall or the Teamer Control deck, which you don't see as much in Best of One, but we'll cover here shortly, um, that can exile, give you some graveyard hate. And instead, we're running the Tishana's Tidebinder. This is usually a sign that, unlike what we saw in Boros Convoke, we're kind of getting mixed signals because this one is usually better against the other Azor control matchups. You can silence something like Imidane's Recruiter or Knight Errant of Eos, but it works a lot better to silence something like Jace or the Wandering Emperor. Um, we're also, uh, speaking of Jace, we're dropping three copies of Jace the Perfected Mind. This one is usually your, uh, your best win condition against other Azorius control matchups, where it usually comes down to mill. And uh, we're also dropping one copy of March of Otherworldly Light. And uh, I say this every week, and I'm going to keep saying it. If this is one of your best tools against Boros Convoke in preventing the turn two Knight Errant of Eos, because you can target the artifact and um, prevent the Gleeful Demolition so that they can't Convoke into the Knight Errant of Eos. And um, we're also seeing uh, they've dropped one copy of Get Lost and one copy of Temporary Lockdown. This one, again, being kind of a signal for Azorius Control. The more Azorius Control, the more likely you're going to see this go down to two. And the less Azorius Control and more Boros Convoke, then the more you're going to see this kind of sneak up to three and sometimes even four. Um, we're dropping the final showdown, which was a Wrath that was a little bit more expensive, but you could save like one of the tokens on the board and had some spree of, uh, split costs with spree. Um, and instead, oh, and, and dropping the one copy of Soul Partition, which kind of helps with um, the tempo being able to bounce something back to your opponent's hand, making it cost you more so that you can deal with it later when you can exile it with Sunfall or, or Farewell. And uh, this week, we're so since we're dropping the final showdown, we're bringing the Sunfall up one, as well as bringing in the Farewell, which gives us some graveyard hate, as well as being able to just exile things like enchantments, because as you'll see this week, we actually did see a slight rise in Celestia enchantments. Um, and then we also brought in a full playset of three steps ahead. Last week it was only two, and instead, uh, and we also brought back the four copies of Deduce. So this one we've seen kind of come and go throughout the weeks, depending on whether or not your opponent is playing around uh, your your counter spells. So the more that you're playing a mid range and a control deck, then the more that you can play around your opponent's control uh, counter spell and. Then, it, then it's helpful to have Deduce because then you can play the draw card at the end of their turn if they didn't play anything. So when we see less mid-range and less control and strictly aggro decks, which can't afford to play around the uh, counter spell, then we see Deduce get dropped in number. And um, we've also seen one copy of Destroy Evil. This one is a longtime favorite of mine, uh, especially against the... Um, old decks and best of three, the Esper midrange deck with Wedding Announcement and Virtue of Loyalty. And it's pretty good in best of one, too, because you can hit the... Um, the most common one I hit is the Boros Convoke. Running If they're running four copies of War Leader's Call and four copies of Case of Gateway Express, it's nice to have a little bit of that enchantment hate to deal especially with the uh, War Leader's Call. 
All right, number five, according to Boros, or, sorry, number five, according to Untapped, was Boros Humans, and we've seen this one for a while there. It was number one on the list, and um, it's very similar to what Boros Convoke is trying to do, but dropping the turn two Knight Errant of Eos play off of Gleeful Demolition, and kind of doing what Mono White is doing, but then adding in the Imidane's Recruiter almost for free because of Cavern of Souls and Secluded Courtyard, um, both being able to cast your uh, human creature types makes it so that Imidane's Recruiter is really easy to play without really putting too much of a tax on the mana base. And then um, as far as the matchup goes against Boros Convoke, a lot of times the Brutal Cathar is pretty handy for being able to switch it back and forth between day and night. can be kind of a deciding factor to get rid of like the Warden of the Inner Sky or the Sanguine Evangelists uh, on your opponent's side. Um, and then it also has the like disruption of the Thalia and the Co Coppercoat Vanguard, which can kind of mess with your temp uh, temporary lockdowns and wraths a little bit better than Boros Convoke. So it's just it's an alternative list that we've seen kind of floating around, and it's still here at uh, number five. And this week we see very few changes, <laughs> dropping one planes for an Aganjo. <laughs> That's it. Or no, sorry, the other way around, dropping one Aganjo for a planes. So that the previous list was running two Aganjo. Number six is Mono Red Prowess. So we do see that uh, last week the um, instant speed interaction was definitely high enough, and people now know to you know how much damage Slickshot Show Off can do. So a lot of builds are automatically including some form of in, uh, interaction for this card, and therefore we've seen the win rate drop. Um, Mono Red Aggro tends to go a little bit later, like I mentioned, than this deck, and. Um, but we're starting to see the two kind of merge together, which we've seen kind of separate out and then merge together throughout the weeks as well. And uh, we're seeing a full playset of Godric Cloaked Reveler. Um, and... Oop, I lost my spot, sorry. And one more copy of the Demonic Ruckus. And so this one is really helpful for the Boros Convoke matchup. Being able to give something like Slickshot Show Off Menace uh, helps get around the 1-1 Flyer off of Sanguine Evangelist or any pesky blockers. Uh, such as that, and then this this one is this is one that we were um, during my community deck text, which I do every Tuesday. Um, we were talking about the potential of running shock, play with fire, and lightning strike. So this version running all three uh, all three full playsets of burn, <laughs> so you can remove problematic blockers or enemy slick shot show offs, as well as just hit a whole bunch of damage directly to their face. And to make room for this, we're dropping um, the Felden Ronum Excavator. Not sure if I mentioned that. Probably did. <laughs> and then um, two mountains going down to a total of 18 lands. So you can see that Mono Red Aggro tends to be a little bit higher curve, doing like 20, 21 lands, whereas I've seen Mono Red Prowess more like 17, 18. And number seven, according to the tracker, is Teamer Control. And we have to go back to week 12, so two weeks ago, when I talked about Teamer Control being in the top eight last. And uh, this is another one that's not going to survive rotation. If you want a uh, builds that I think will survive rotation, def I, you know, look for my rotation ready video. Um, that way you can slaughter all of the people who are exploring things in Bloomboro and just go with the like tried and true. <laughs> Um, but this one is a classic. It's been around for a while. A lot of people are happy to see it go because the sheer amount of triggers that you have to keep track of is insane. You can, especially in paper, this is a real pain to play. In arena, it just makes your opponent have to be patient. And, uh, but we're, we're seeing uh, they dropped one copy of the Virtue of Strength. Sometimes we see this fluctuate to three and four. Uh, personally, I haven't even crafted the fourth one because I like playing it with the three Virtue of Loyalties. And uh, we brought back the Colossal Sky Turtle, which I really like having the bounce against the uh, Boros Convoke matchup. And uh, it does pair with Shigeki to be able to give you an infinite loop through your, uh, through your library. And then as far as the lands go, we dropped the Echoing Deeps, kind of see this one kind of come and go. Um, it's one, it's an additional kind of sack land because you can copy one of the sack lands in your graveyard. The awkward moment is, of course, when you don't have a sack land to copy. Um, and instead, we're running one copy of Ottawara Soaring City. And this is one I haven't seen before, and I really like it because it gives you the bounce like the Colossal Sky Turtle without taxing the mana base too hard. And number eight on the list was Lesney Enchantments, and this one's been around since Neon Dynasty and is another one that I'm going to be kind of sad to see go. Uh, you don't see it as much as you used to. It definitely was a very prevalent meta deck, and now 
you know, whenever I play a long session, I'll bump into like maybe one or two. Um, but this one was the eighth performing deck. And if we compare this, we have to go back to week 10. Uh, so four weeks ago, Celestian Enchantments was in the top eight. And this list is deciding to bring in the two copies of Skrelv. So generally we see lists with Skrelv being included whenever Mono Red Prowess starts to dip down. It's because everybody's running this instant speed interaction like cut down and go for the throat. So then bring in your Skrelves if you're a Mono White player or if you're a white player. And um, that way you can kind of answer the, your opponent's single point interaction. And uh, to make room for this though, what we've decided to do is make space for it in the lands. So we dropped two forests and one plains and an overground farmland to bring in the three copies of the Brushland and run a very low, um, very low land count. So I'm excited to see how this one plays. If I get around to it before rotation happens, we'll see. All right, and now for the deep dives. For those who like best of three, we do have the uh, results from last weekend's tournament winners. So what I like to do is I like to go over the uh, top three. Again, this kind of one way to remove my bias and just kind of try to keep things neutral, you know, because <laughs> uh, one of the things that I hate about Magic the Gathering is arguing about like what is what, right? Everything has pros and cons. And uh, so anyway, um, this week we can see first place on Saturday was taken down by um, La L. And if we compare this to week or last week, we can see that they dropped the Myrix and the Sundown Pass in the lands to bring in an Aganjo and a Mountain, otherwise just keeping the core the uh, the same. And uh, so favoring the Case of the Gateway Express and the Sanguine Evangelist instead of the War Leader's Call. And in best of, in the best of three sideboard, we can see that they uh, did a relatively large change, changing out eight cards. So they dropped the four copies of the Lantern Flare, which is a, a way to kind of gain life similar to Knockout Blow, but because of how go wide this deck works, sometimes the Lantern Flare uh, might even work better than the Knockout Blow. And um, but so we've seen a decrease in Mono Red in the tournament scene in the standard challenge on Magic the Gathering online. And um, so we don't need the Lantern Flares, or at least the pilot didn't think so. Um, also ditching the Lithomanic Barrage, which is a pretty good one against blue and white to bring in, you know, against like Esper midrange and uh, dropping the three copies of the wedding announcement, which honestly was kind of a, a bit of a fluke. I, ha I haven't seen other Boros <laughs> Convoke lists uh, running the wedding announcement. And instead, we're going back to some of the tried and true. So we've got the one additional copy of the In the Festivities, which is particularly good against Boros Convoke. Uh, we've got the uh, an additional copy of the Invasion of Gobicon. I really like this one against Esper Midrange to delay like Rafine on turn three. And uh, that's where I generally look to sideboard it in. Um, we've also got two copies of Thalia, Garden, Guardian of Thraven. This one actually works pretty well against the uh, Mirror Match and uh, anything that's really spell heavy. So again, if you go back in time, you can look at my best of three sideboard guide and I talk about the pros and cons of Thalia. And um, we've also got two copies of the Anointed Peacekeeper, this one being a good way to delay the Sunfalls and Wraths to depopulate and such in your opponent's uh, deck. And then we also have two copies of the Herbrask Forge, and this is the one that we more commonly see that, rather than the Wedding Announcement that kind of gives you this late game inevitability if they don't have an answer for the artifact. Second place was taken down by Orsov Control by uh, Cabeza de Bolo, and they were uh, just a couple of weeks ago, they were also in the top three for an Orsov kind of mid range build. And this one leaning more towards what we've seen kind of popping up in best of one occasionally is the nurturing per pixie combo where you're bouncing stuff like Tithing Blade or Virus Beetle or Hopeless Nightmare to get this like additional ETB effect as well as a 2 2 flyer for one. And, um, We've also got the Hostile Investigators, which are really good against the uh, Azorius Control, making them discard, gaining you that kind of like value over your opponent. Uh, four copies of Braids. And this one I actually hadn't seen a whole lot in the other Orsov Control lists. So I um, thought that was a fun inclusion, as well as the uh, Guardian of Girapur, which allows you to blink your Nurturing Pixie, which then allows you to blink your Tithing Blade in your Hopeless Nightmare. And I'm surprised I haven't seen more of this in this build. 
Um, we've also got the Path of Peril, which is kind of like if we come up against Boros Convoke, which the Tithing Blade combo doesn't work as well because they're able to create the 1-1 one -one tokens. Um, it's nice to be able to just completely reset the board. And then the Hopeless Nightmares also work really well for the Rite of Oblivion, giving you this kind of sacrifice fodder that triggers your Scry 2. So new archetype, at least in the top three for best of three in the um, standard challenge. And as far as the sideboard goes, we've got uh, Duress to hate on Azorius Control. We've got Lorne of the Third Path to hate on the Esper midrange lists that are running the wedding announcements and the Virtue of Loyalties. Um, some Esper midrange lists aren't running a full enchantment set, so you do want to kind of pay attention for that. Uh, the other one that's also really enchantment heavy is Boros Convoke, running the case of the Gateway Express and the War Leader's Call. We've got two additional copies of Path of Peril if we can bring them in against Boros Convoke. Uh, Shielded the Apocalypse helps us against Mono Red, giving us some life stabilization every time that we draw a card. The three copies of Rest in Peace are for standard uh, against the uh, four color, five color Legends deck or Slogar decks, as well as the Teamer Landfall or Teamer Control decks. Anything that you need to be able to attack the graveyard, Rest in Peace is um, one way to go about it. You can also use Kutzel's Flanker. Uh, we've also got the two copies of the Virus Beetle, and I, I think you're largely going to be bringing in the Virus Beetles over the Tithing Blade if the Tithing Blade looks like it's going to be bad, right? Against Azorius Control, it's not running enough creatures, then you'd much rather be discarding and doing hand hate rather than creature hate. Uh, we've also got an additional copy of Saragon, uh, Sarah Paragon to be able to replay our creatures from the graveyard. Uh, a third copy of the Hostile Investigator. Again, I speculate this is probably for Azorius Control. And then a second copy of Shieldred the Apocalypse. Third place was Mono Red Aggro by Mana La Xiao. Mana La Chao? <laughs> Sorry, I massacred that name. Um, in best of three, because it doesn't have the best of one hand smoother, um, you're going to have a higher amount of mana, and you're also going to have a, a, a slower curve. Uh, so you're going to see more four drops than you traditionally will see in the best of one lists. Uh, best of three playing a lot more like it does in paper. Now, uh, we have to go back to week 11 for a, the last top three for Mono Red. And there was a huge surge in Mono Red there uh, for a while. And uh, compared to that list, though, we can see that they dropped one copy of the Charming Scoundrel and brought in the two copies of the Phoenix Chick, as well as two copies of the Thundering Raiju. And so going for a little bit more of a creature-centric strategy where we can guarantee having something to put a plus one, plus one counter on for the Thundering Raiju. And to make room for this, we dropped the two uh, play with fires, as well as the one copy of Obliterating Bolt. And in the best of three sideboard, we can see a slight rework as well. We see they dropped the three copies of the Soul Guide Lantern, which was kind of the deck's um, choice for Legends and Teamer Control, the Graveyard Hate. And we dropped the three copies of Koth, Fire of Resistance, which um, kind of helps you against the uh, board wipes because the board wipes don't hit Planeswalkers. And then we also dropped the two copies of the Elder Dragon War, which was kind of like an exploration um, for Boros Convoke that could also be not as dead of a card if you didn't end up with against Boros Convoke. Um, but yeah, I think largely the, the in the festivities is just going to be a better way to go about it. Um, so we're going up to a full playset of four in the festivities. We're also bringing in three copies of the Lithomanic Barrage. Again, this one being a particularly nice one to bring in if you're up against blue or white, um, because you can also hit Planeswalkers. So it's a pretty good card against Esper Midrange and Azorius Control. And then we have four copies of the Furnace Punisher. And uh, largely, as we're going to get into a little bit later, Domain, Domain is, is, is seeing a lot of play right now, largely because it's going away at least for a little bit. Uh, it might be back in the set following Bloomborough. We'll see. Um, but right now, there's a whole ton of it, and Furnace Punisher is a great way to punish the uh, decks that are running a ton of the non-basics. So any of the three-color decks, Furnace Punisher is a good one to bring in in those matchups. And there's a second uh, playset of standard challenges on Saturday now, so we've got three tournaments to cover. Uh, which I like because it just means I get to talk about more Magic the Gathering. <laughs> um, but first place was taken down by uh, Domain by OVML Cabrera. And if we compare this one to last week, we can see that they dropped the Topiary Stompers, uh, brought in a one copy of Jace the Perfected Mind in the main, uh, dropped two copies of the Depopulate and one Sunfall, uh, brought down the two Long Goodbyes and brought in two additional Lightning Helixes. 
uh, which go pair, which pair nicely with the Ancient Cornucopia, being able to give you five life uh, when you cast them if this is in play. And then uh, an additional copy, or bringing in a copy of Get Lost, as well as bumping up the Beanstalk up to four, and bringing in three temporary lockdowns, which, you know, uh, just showcases there's, a, you know, the amount of Boros Convoke in the standard challenge as well. Um, so this is kind of playing a little bit more like what I was calling the Bant, um, the Bant control space, because if you get rid of the Long Goodbye and the Atraxa, it's, it's kind of like this, maybe Bant's not the right word, because now you've got the Lightning Helix too. But anyway, um, more of a uh, four-color control space and that we've seen kind of before. This one not running the ill-timed explosion that we have been seeing it like being explored. Um, but we, we had three top three finishes, one of which was an exact copy of this list, including the sideboard. And then the other one, which is the one that was I covered last week in week 13 with no changes to the list or the sideboard. So 30% of the top threes were domain this week. And um, as far as the sideboard goes, though, we can see that they uh, dropped one Jace because they they moved it into the main. Uh, they dropped two copies of the Lightning Helix because they brought it into the main and dropped one temporary lockdown because they brought it into the main. <laughs> and um, well, so they brought they brought it three into the main and they used to have two in the sideboard to bring in for Boros Convoke. Anyway, so we can bring this all the way up to four if we are up against Boros Convoke. Um, and then turn the earth, bringing this one in. If you are up against another control matchup and it goes to mill, this one you can play before you draw. So this gives you some additional... Um, this gives you some additional way to not die to mill. And then uh, we've also got one copy of Get Lost. This one, a good, good against Planeswalkers, good against Enchantments. I just, I really, Get Lost is pretty good in the control space. Um, the pros and cons, I guess, bring like whether or not you want the long goodbye over it, because like map tokens do matter in some matchups. Um, but we also have that option for the long goodbye. And then um, one copy of Depopulate. So if you're up against a really aggressive strategy that's rolling out really quickly, then the Depopulates can be advantageous to Sunfall because they happen a turn sooner. And this one was a really fun one to see. Um, so second place was taken down by Cascade by Matsukasa 10. And this one we've seen, it, it's fallen out of popularity, but there was there was a moment there where people were kind of worried about the, how this was going to affect the meta. Uh, at, at least some people were. Um, because if you don't have any, if you don't have anything that's small enough in your deck, when you play the Invasion of Alara, it looks for cards that are mana value four or less. And so if your if if your only cards that are mana for value four or less are the Bramble Familiar, it allows you to hit the Bramble the, the Bramble Familiar. And the reason why that's important is because you can play the adventure side of it, even though it's finding the creature side of it. So because of the way that it's worded, you can play the the uh, fetch quest, which then allows you to put a creature, an enchantment, or land from among the milled cards onto the battlefield, which then lets you do the invasion of Alara, and you just kind of do these really crazy cascade loops. And then you also have the Cemetery Desecrator in here, which if you are, um, you, this allows you th th to then for free flip the invasion of Alara um, into the Awaken the Maelstrom for, Maelstrom for additional value, um, as long as you can exile the uh, seven cost card from your graveyard, which among your milled cards, you have a whole ton of that as a possibility. Um, and then we've got like forest cycling, the land fetching that can gain you life off of the herd migration, uh, virtue persistence to remove targets and stall until we have to hit our turn five play. Uh, we've got the trumpeting carnosaur, which can discover into the invasion of Alara. We've got the leyline binding for removal. Elish Norn for double the triggers as well as stopping their triggers, which matters in um, Boros Convoke and um, Teamer Landfall. And uh, then we also have the Harvester of the Mis of Misery. So as far as the changes go, we have to go all the way back to week eight of Outlaws of Thunder Junction. And the only change that happened to this list was dropping Malevolent Hermit um, to bring in the Harvester of Misery. And I like that change because Malevolent Hermit was something that you could hit off of the Invasion of Alara instead of your Bramble Familiar. And then uh, we dropped one Rafine's Tower and brought in a Xander's Lounge to just kind of reflect the um, Double Pip Black instead of the blue card. 
and I forgot to write down the um, changes to the best of three sideboard. And um, we can see that they're running a full playset of binding no negotiation to hate on your opponent's hand. Uh, we've got the Cruelty of Gix to be able to tutor for our combo piece. We've got Nissa Ascended Animist, which can give us kind of this overrun effect. Uh, we've got Pithing Needle to hate on our opponent's specific strategies. Uh, Cease and Desist to attack the graveyard. Um, Unlicensed Hearst to attack the graveyard as well. And um, four copies of the Decadent Dragon. <clears throat> and uh, this one, being able to exile your opponent's graveyard to play their cards. And then the Urgent uh, Necropsy, which you can then use the fact that you have a lot of um, mill to be able to collect evidence for specific removal. All right. And third place was taken down by Azorius Control by CPDJ. And um, if we compare this to week 11, was the last time that I talked about Azorius Control specifically in best of three. And we can see that they dropped the one copy of Jace the Perfected Mind, uh, one Farewell, and brought in an additional copy of Temporary Lockdown. So a fair amount of the number, a fair number of the decks this week deciding to run three, showcasing that there was a fair amount of Boros Convoke in the uh, standard showcase. Uh, also running one additional copy of Depopulate, and as far as the lands go, dropping the Darker Wastes and the Seachrome Coast to bring in the Sunken Citadel, which can help with activating our man lands, and the Meticulous Archive and one copy of Myrix. As far as the best of three sideboard go, we see a huge rework. So this, uh, we dropped the Chrome Host Sea Shark, the Holebreaker Horror, the Kutzel's Flanker, the Elspeth Smite, the Negates, the Rest in Peace, and two copies of Temporary Lockdown, and um, brought in three copies of Requisition Raid. This one being able to kind of give you some artifact and enchantment hate, as well as being able to board pump, which <laughs> is kind of a curious one, although we can have a board off of Wandering Emperor and Myrix. Um, they also are bringing in two copies of the Disdainful Stroke. So usually we see the negates in the Azorius control list, this one doing Disdainful Stroke. This one working particularly well against the decks that have the higher end curves, like the um, like uh, Domain. And my brain is OK, I lost my place again, sorry. Um, yeah, okay, we were also bringing in the Boonbrinker Val the Boonbringer Valkyries. This one we saw uh, was the sideboard of choice for the um, Pro Tour a couple months ago. And Boonbringer Valkyrie being able to give you that lifelink on the backup can really help stabilize against early pressure. And then um, we've also got the uh, Ezrim Agency Chief. And this one, as long as you have that one mana to be able to hold up the artifact that you can get off of like deduce, um, makes it a very difficult thing for your opponent to deal with because you have a 5-5 five, five hexproof. Um, that's, you know, if it, I, I like these sort of things a lot for the mirror. So again, if you go and look at my best of three sideboard guide, I talk about kind of like bringing in the, um, like the whole breaker horror and uh, having these kind of top end threats that if you can get them down, then you kind of win the matchup against the mirror. So I think that's really where like Ezrim is going to be really nice. And then we're also bringing in one copy of farewell. If we needed an additional sweeper and uh, if they're, if we're playing up against artifacts or some, you know, something that really cares about their graveyard. All right, and the 15th and final deck that I'm going to talk about is the second place winner for Teamer, uh, Teamer Control by Casa. And um, again, first place and third place were taken down by the domain lists in on Saturday. Uh, sorry, on Sunday. So um, either they were the exact same list that I covered. Um, that was the one that took down first place was the list I already covered. And the one that took down third place was the one that I covered last week. So... Um, Teamer Control, though, uh, this is another one that's going to be going away because of the sack lands. We get one more week to, you know, play with our favorite decks before they go away in rotation. And um, if we compare this one to last week, we can see that they dropped one copy of Kellen, Inquisitive Prodigy, to bring in Titan of Industry. We usually see this as a sideboard card, um, so kind of kind of interesting to see it in the main. Uh, and we also dropped one Spelunking to bring in one Vampire's Vengeance. So the pilot anticipating there being enough Boros Convoke to um, justify bringing the Vampire's Vengeance in the main instead of starting it in the sideboard. Uh, similarly, the Titan of Industry is 
I can't remember off the top of my head which matchups are the most problematic for the big beef. But anything that um, doesn't have like the, the board sweepers, um, Titan of Industry works well for. And um, the best of three sideboard, though, we can see. So they, they, they took out a uh, one copy of Bonnie Paul clear cutter and took out the one copy of Titan of Industry and brought it into the main. Um, and instead, oh, and, and the one vamp Vampire's Vengeance, because they brought it into the main, um, running an additional copy of a braid to give us some more artifact hate, as well as one additional copy of Tranquil Frillback, which can give us some artifact and enchantment hate. I really like the Tranquil Frillback because of the versatility it brings. You can use it against team or control to exile their graveyard. You can use it against legends to exile their graveyard. You can use it uh, to gain four life against mono red. Um, and then you can use it against enchantment heavy decks like the Boros Convoke that's running the uh, War Leader's Call and the Case of the Gateway Express, then Tranquil Frillback can be a good card to bring in. So um, I like that, that they have that. Uh, and then the Nissa Ascended Animist is one that we don't usually see because there's not much of a board presence. But when you're sideboarding into more of like Titan of Industries or maybe your Bonnie Paul or your Roxanne, um, then you can have more of a board presence and Nissa giving you that overrun effect, as well as just repeatable artifact and enchantment hate. So that's it for my best of three and best of one meta review. Um, remember to click like and subscribe if you like this sort of thing. I try to do one of these every Monday. Um, next week, we're not going to be able to do it because there's no real reason to review something that's going to go away in a day. <laughs> So next week, I'm going to be talking about um, my speculative builds for uh, Bloomboro. And so we'll be doing some like maybe some new archetypes, kind of like what some new cards could fit into some of the old archetypes. And, you know, I haven't built it yet. I haven't really done it yet. So we'll see where where I end up in uh, in a week. So, um, yeah, thanks for thanks for being a part of the community. And if you're new here, welcome. And uh, I will catch you all tomorrow for the community deck techs. Take care, everybody.